Uh, I don't have a full batch of slides for you tonight, but I am going to start with, uh, uh, with one or two. And this is my hometown neck of the woods, the Chesapeake Bay. And now there's a fable about my uh, early childhood that I'll not repeat tonight involving the Chesapeake. But the, the Chesapeake Bay uh, is really a defining feature for the state of Maryland. It almost cuts it in half. Um, there's a theory about its origin, and I don't know what to make of it, but there's a theory that there was a large meteor strike that hit right around where the Maryland-Virginia border is, and that it is so deep that it created this rift known as the Chesapeake. The effect of it, however the Chesapeake was formed, is that almost the entire state of Maryland is a drain from the hills in the west and all the plains um, to the east and then the hill country in the north, everything drains. There are rivers all over the place. I grew up right near the Patuxent River and the Potomac River wasn't far away. It is so much of a drain that there are no natural lakes or ponds in the state of Maryland. A lot of artificial ones, a lot of swamps, but no natural lakes or ponds because of the contour of the land and it all drains. Now, I mentioned that this evening because uh, we're considering this evening um, the book of Genesis about the faithful creator who keeps covenant forever. And the reason that there needs to be covenants, the reason that the faithfulness of God is so important is because of what happens in Genesis 3, the curse. The curse is the, the fall of man is like a meteor strike in human history and everything drains into it. There's no getting out of it without some effort from above to change things. So this evening we are going to finish our review of the book of Genesis. If you were with us last Sunday night, uh, I had a different handout for you and we talked about, you can see in the, at the top of tonight's handout, the portions that are in gray. We talked last week about the purpose of Genesis and how it was intended to be the introduction to the Torah, the, the, first, the, the whole book of Moses. And we shared the background, how it gives the background to the covenant that was made at Mount Sinai. And that secondarily it introduces the rest of the Bible. And we talked about the structure of Genesis, how it is. It's a unique structure that there are, you've heard me say uh, uh, 10,000 times probably, that there are 10 times in the book where it says, these are the generations of such and such. And that is what punctuates the book. And that is written in an off-balance style, that generally you have a long story followed by a short one, long section by a short one, long section by a short one. That works pretty much its way all the way through the book. Where I want to pick up this evening is to talk about the message of Genesis, and mostly we're going to be talking about key themes that are in the book. Now this morning what I did is I preached a review of the book as we did a zipline tour through the whole book and tried to hit as many of the high points as we could. Tonight is going to be different. We're not going to go from chapter 1 to chapter 50 that way. We're going to kind of uh, fly over the book and zoom in and out. We're going to trace some themes that run all throughout it. I'll, I'll be referring to some passages. I'm assuming as I give this study tonight uh, that most of you were here this morning, that most of you have been here through our study in Genesis, or at the least that you know something about the book of Genesis. Uh, if we turned to every passage we could, we wouldn't get past, I think, the first page and a half. Um, so uh, bear with me if we don't turn to as many portions as you might like. Now look with me there at number three on your handout. It says the message of Genesis. Moses provides Israel with an explanation of their origins, showing God's plan to restore the corrupted creation through the development of his chosen seed. And do you notice how I've spelled the word seed there? With a capital S and a small s. The small s is, of course, what will become Israel. And the capital S is the greatest offspring of Israel, whom we know to be the Lord Jesus. Genesis does give information on cosmic origins. Chapter 1 talks about is a cosmic creation account. Uh, we recently had a, 
uh, representative from the Institute of Creation Research, and uh, I am very thankful for ministries like that, which are helping us to see the, the biblical origins of uh, the creation and dealing with a lot of the, the false information that is so popular within educational and scientific uh, communities. Um, but we need to know that the, when Moses wrote Genesis 1, he wasn't battling evolution. He wrote Genesis 1 and 2 to help Israel know where they came from. So while the first couple chapters emphasize where humanity as a whole came from, most of the book of Genesis is explaining where Israel came from. Explaining to the Israelites in Moses' day, who were just freed from slavery by the powerful hand of God, how they had gotten there, how they had gotten the way that they were, and how God had a plan for them. And of course, it's more than just their history. Our history is found in it as well because, letter B, the corruption of the creation in Genesis 3, the story of the fall and the curse that comes after it, colors all the rest of the book. Now, that's perhaps the understatement of the night. It, it covers all, colors all the rest of the Bible. It colors all of human history. It was a deep impact, like a meteor strike in human existence. But God is not thwarted by that. God's plan was not disturbed by that. God is determined from the beginning to bring blessing and to restore His rule in the earth through mankind. Remember how when God made uh, man, the first thing He tells him to do, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. And they're to have dominion over the birds of the air and the uh, fish of the sea and the animals of the land and so forth. God's kingdom established on earth. Sin has made a mess of our ability to represent God's kingdom. But God has not abandoned his kingdom plan. In a sense, Genesis is setting the scene for the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. A kingdom that would be known in, a sh in small form in the nation of Israel. A kingdom that will no be known in its fullest form when the king comes back. And we shall reign with him forever. Genesis 3.15, which we looked at this morning, I suppose that's a good place for us to start since we're speaking about uh, the curse. The curse also foretells the cure. The capital S seed of the woman who will crush the serpent's head. As God cursed that serpent, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman. That there's going to be ongoing animosity. And I don't think this is about women being naturally afraid of snakes. That's been read that way, but I, this serpent is no ordinary serpent. Um, this is not some special curse on all snakes. It, this, these verses don't teach you it's wrong to have a pet snake. Uh, there's something different about this serpent, and there is animosity between him and the woman, and between the serpent's seed and her seed and this seed, that there is going to be an offspring of this woman who will bruise you on the head. A crushing. Literally, he will crush you. And you shall bruise him on the heel. These are asymmetrical blows. This is a prophecy in the midst of a curse, mind you, that there is a cure for all of this. And all of this is fitting in with the divine plan. Much of the book of Genesis traces the, de the development of the chosen seed. We'll see later on that the idea of seed, offspring, is one of the major themes in the book of Genesis. God's plan is realized in many stages. When uh, Israel first read the book of Genesis, they were experiencing the restoration of God's presence. I, I shared this last Sunday night. This is a key thing now. When God comes down onto the mountain at Mount Sinai in Moses' day, he is doing something right there that he had not done since the Garden of Eden. That is to dwell in the presence of mankind again. There's a partial restoration of 
God's presence in the world. It's not complete because the people now, are, they're, they're sinful and, and they're, they're laden with sin and the, the whole sacrificial system reminds them of that again. But there's a partial restoration of that. There's a partial sanctification of the earth again, at least a part of the earth, because a part of the world is being set apart for them. A holy place that they are to keep holy, the promised land. And he is again establishing a kingdom nation. Genesis is preparing Israel to see their role in the world as part of God's restoration of things. So that, in a nutshell, is, I think, the key messages of Genesis. Now, I want us to consider, lastly, and this, uh, what follows is about two dozen bullet points that I've grouped together in a few ways, some key themes in the book of Genesis. Uh, and I've grouped them in a few ways. We're, we'll talk about some things about God's activity. We'll talk about some angelic activity and human activity. And lastly, some physical settings. There's about two dozen of them all combined. Let's consider God's activity. I mean, it begins with God doing something that only God can do, creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They did not make themselves. We did not make ourselves. God does that which only he can do. There is nothing like this in the rest of Genesis. Nobody imitates God this way. Yes, God made man in his image, but that doesn't mean we can do that. We can't speak things into existence. We don't have that ability. Uh, something utterly unique about our God. He's a creator, and he also creates People, he, by, his, by his choosing, by his selecting, by his calling, he creates people to be new things as well. You see Abraham later on being called, chosen to go out of Ur of the Chaldees, to go down into Canaan and to make a nation out of them. That's the work of the creator God. Flip to the second page and here's another big theme about God in Genesis and that is dominion dominion. God is king. Now that label is not used of him in Genesis, but the idea is clearly there. After all, if he's telling mankind that you are to rule the earth, it suggests that he has the authority to give that, to delegate authority. He delegates his authority to the man and the woman in the garden to rule Unlike any of the other creatures, as beautiful, as interesting, as fantastic as they were, none of them were designed to govern like man was. In fact, I would suggest that when the scripture says that man is made in God's image, that a large part of that is that we were designed to govern in God's place. And that's why, by the way, after we've sinned, which we all have, after Adam sins, he does not lose the image of God. He still has it. He's just not able to reflect it as properly as he should. Even unsaved people bear the image of God. There's some mark upon them for which they were designed. And if you look back in Genesis when it talks about them being made in the image of God, look with me in, uh, in chapter 1, uh, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And what's the very next thing? And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Dominion was delegated. But boy, I'll tell you, sin makes a mess of our ability to rule. <laughs> all you have to do is watch the news and see a modern, modern examples of that. Uh, doesn't matter what party you're in, we, we all make a mess of things. We are still obligated to represent God, but sin has damaged our ability to do it. So one of the great principles of Scripture, one of the great themes of Scripture as a whole, again, is the kingdom. The king is going to reestablish his rule in the earth. And guess who's going to rule and reign at the end? The man. Christ Jesus. The God-man will reign as the last Adam and restore what was lost. Dominion was delegated in the garden. Another huge theme in Genesis is divine sovereignty. This is, sovereignty is an act of kingship. 
The, and, and God is sovereign unlike any other human sovereign. Uh, he is able to do things that no other potentate can do. Uh, you, you see his sovereignty in his choices. Uh, Noah, he, he chooses Abraham seemingly out of the blue. And notice that when God picks the descendant of Abraham uh, through whom the blessing would flow, it's not the firstborn child that people in that culture would naturally expect. The firstborn child, Ishmael, illegitimate child in a sense, yes, but nonetheless the firstborn, God bypasses him and goes to Isaac. That's God's doing. Isaac has two boys, legitimate boys, Esau and Jacob. God bypasses Esau and chooses Jacob. Jacob has 12 boys. God bypasses the first and the second and the third and the fourth. And Joseph early on is the one with dominance. Later on it'll be in the long range it'll be Judah who I think is number four. That's sovereignty. That's God executing his will. And we've also shared recently in our studies of the life of Joseph about God's hidden hand. God's orchestration of events for our good and for his glory. That famous verse at the end of the book, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. The hidden hand of God is there all through every page bringing about his plan. Dominion is a huge theme in the book of Genesis. Another theme is revelation. And by that, I don't mean the book of Revelation, but God's revealing himself. It, it starts with the spoken word. I mean, uh, the, the first, one of the first things we see God doing uh, is speaking. God created the heaven and the earth, right? And the earth was without form and void. That is, initially, after the, the initial act, the initial moment of creation, things were unformed and unfilled. It was a, a mass, uh, God was in control of it, but it was a mess. And so in the creation week, God forms and fills the world. And he does it all by a word. Let there be light. And Moses says, and there was light. <laughs> we have a God who speaks. He speaks in chapter 1, in chapter 2, in chapter 3, in chapter 4. Nothing in chapter 5. Again in 6. And then when we come to the age of the patriarchs, the majority of the book, chapters 11 to 50, he speaks uh, mostly to three people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by the spoken word. There are a few other instances, but those three are the ones who receive most of the spoken words. He also reveals himself occasionally by theophany, that is by dramatic appearance of his presence. And I'm going to have you look at one of these with me that often is not regarded as this, but I, I think it is. Genesis 3, verse uh, 7 and 8, right after the, the fall of Adam and Eve. Verse 7 says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. You know, the serpent had told them that they would gain new understanding and Boy, they did, but what they came to understand wasn't what they were hoping for. Uh, now, verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Hebrew text, I was just taking my students through this yesterday, is quite fascinating. They they heard the sound of the Lord God. And the word for walking is not in the normal form. It's a word that suggests, a form that suggests back and forth motion. Going back and forth in the garden. In, in, literally, in the wind of the day. Uh, and they hide themselves. I would suggest to you that what they are hearing is the first theophany of God in wrath. God has a showed up in a way he never has before. He has come to call them to an account and they hide themselves. It is the first of many theophanies in the Old Testament and of a few others in the book of Genesis. 
Abraham has a theophany of God by vision in chapter 15 uh, when the Lord makes a covenant with him, assuring him that these things that he's called him to, that these things that he's promised him, he will bring to pass. Perhaps when the angel of the Lord visits him in uh, chapters uh, 19, perhaps this also is a theophany of God. Perhaps a little more common than theophany is dreams. Uh, dreams particularly given to people like Joseph. Uh, it's interesting that God, God reveals things to Joseph, but not through the spoken word. It's through dreams and through uh, an ability to understand. Dreams. Uh, there are some unsaved people, unregenerate people who receive dreams as well. Pharaoh, the early Pharaoh, gets a dream. Uh, the Pharaoh in Joseph's day gets a dream. God is revealing things, although not, notice how sometimes the way God reveals things, it makes you search and explore and study what's going on. There are some things that God reveals that are crystal clear and other things that force us and compel us to explore and go deeper. So we've seen a few themes so far, creation, dominion, revelation. Here's a fourth one about God's activity promise and covenant. We already looked at Genesis 3.15, the, what's often called the proto-evangelium, the first gospel of the promise of the seed who will crush the serpent's head. Beautiful prophecy. There are also oaths, covenantal oaths that God makes, first with Noah and then with Abraham, and then he ratifies it to Abraham's son and grandson and grandchild, great-grandchildren. Now, a covenant is a special kind of promise. Uh, if I say to my kids, and I'm going to get in trouble here, uh, we will go for ice cream sometime. Well, I guess I'd have to give a specific time. I might even make a promise, but, you know, things happen. Things happen, sometimes beyond my control, and we have to explain, I'm sorry, we can't go, we have to go feed the parrot or something like that. But... Uh, we don't have one of those, but that sounds like a good excuse. A promise uh, is an important thing, but a covenant, that is like a promise on steroids. A covenant brings witnesses together. A covenant is sealed with oaths. Uh, in, in our modern culture, the only, uh, just about the only kind of interaction we have like that is when someone like me or Pastor Ed stands here and we say, do you so-and-so take such and such to be your lawfully wedded such and such? And they say, we do. And we call all these people to witness. They seal it with an oath and give a symbol of the covenant. Usually it's a ring. God makes an oath a covenantal oath with Noah. And you know, covenants become important after the fall and after the flood because humanity has proven itself to be so untrustworthy. And so God uses a means of communicating to assure them of His faithfulness and to call them to faithfulness as well. He makes a covenant with Noah, a covenant that still has ongoing effects today, a covenant that God does not intend to up in the world every couple centuries with a giant flood. Can you imagine going through that and living through it and thinking, huh, well, I better keep the ark ready. <laughs> They're going to need this again. But God assures them, no, this was a one-time thing. And from here on out, you can expect regularity of cycles and seasons. I have, what's implied in that is I have a gracious plan for this planet. And it's not revealed there, but it lays the foundation for everything else that God will do in redemptive history. He makes a covenant with Abraham, uh, with, with one man and his family, that through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Through you I'm going to raise up a nation. And then he extends that covenant. He makes covenantal assurances to Abraham again and again and again. He reminds him of that oath that he had made. He reminds Isaac of it. He reminds Jacob of it. How many times have we, did we read this morning, I am the God of your father, Abraham. I am the God of your father, Isaac. I, I'm the one who spoke back then and made covenant, and I'm assuring you of that now, too. Covenantal assurances. Number five, we find in Genesis that God is a God of blessing. At the very beginning, he declares blessing. Uh, God created everything, and then uh, he created Adam and Eve, and then it says, and he blessed them. 
In fact, there's, there's kind of a rhyme. Um, he blessed the creatures that, that he had made. The word for create that's often used is bara, and the word for bless is barak. It's a rhyme, but it's more than just nifty poetry. God blessed everything from the beginning, and then he cursed everything, <laughs> rightly so. But that was not the end of his blessing. He continues to bless. He promised blessing in the future to Noah, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he protected his people in the present. How about what we read about how Joseph was in, literally in the pits. He's in the, the pit that where he'd be taken captive, and he ends up in the prison pit. But we're told again and again, God was with him. That is the blessing of God. And God did exceedingly abundantly above whatever Joseph could have thought and bring him into a position where he would be a blessing to his family. Now, you can't talk about blessing without mentioning curse. Of course, the curse of God is pronounced after the fall. It affects all of creation. The effects of it continue today. Curse is threatened over the opponents of God's people as well. Remember in Genesis 12 when God first promises to Abraham what he's going to do? I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. An intensification of the curse that, it, that was generally in place in creation already. And God's power to curse, which includes judgment, and uh, is demonstrated in history. I mean, you see it with the, the couple banished out of the garden. They, they move out of the garden, which is in Eden, and are still living in the region of Eden. Their son, Cain, kills their other son, and he's banished from the region of Eden. That was a further curse. And the flood was a demonstration of God's curse. And after the flood, there are some key times when God just intervenes to almost as if to remind the wicked world that they must still give an account and that not all judgment is reserved into the last day. Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain come under the direct righteous judgment of God. And how about the plagues of Egypt? Now, I know we think about the plagues of Egypt as being an exodus, and they are mostly, but there are some plagues of Egypt in Genesis. Remember early on, you've got, uh, in Abraham's day, the Pharaoh there, people start getting sick. They, his, his, uh, his harem can't have children until the, Lord, uh, until the Lord speaks to him to let Abraham go. And how about in the days of Joseph? There is a plague on the land. That, that famine is, is like a precursor of the plagues of Egypt that will come later on. And remember that interesting time, the wise men of Egypt can't figure it out. Just like in Moses' day, the wise men of Egypt couldn't figure out how to stop those plagues. That's the hand of God. God is at work very much. He, is, gets, the, he gets the the first word in the book, doesn't he? Well, let me say something about angelic activity in Genesis. There's not a lot said, but it is interesting. We are introduced to angels in the book of Genesis. Now, in Jewish interpretation, they've commonly said that the phrase, let us make man in our image, that God is talking to the angels there. Christians have long interpreted that as a, a, a veiled reference to the Trinity. Um, whichever that might be, what's clear is the first clear reference to angels are in the garden. At the end of chapter 3, when they are banished from the garden, look, look at this with me, uh, verse 24 so he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim, the cherubim, and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Cherubim means plural, cherubs, and these are no fat little Valentine's Day baby angels. These are guardian angels. Uh, these are the kind of angelic beings, I think, that Daniel and Ezekiel and John see, who are, look part animal, part man. That'll get your attention. And then there's one flaming sword, which is m either moving back and forth or twirling around. Nothing says, do not pass like that. The angels are made visible to keep man from going in back into the garden, apparently there's something about the tree of life that if they had consumed it in their fallen state, 
it would have resulted in a, a permanent state of fallenness. And so that path is guarded. Angels are there guarding the garden. They are sometimes sending messages. We have the story of the, and the visitors who come to Abraham to warn him about, about what's going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. One of them, I believe, to be a Christophany. The others apparently are angels. Angels go to Sodom to pull Lot and his family out of there. And then, of course, there is, we mentioned this morning, about Jacob's ladder. Jacob on the run from his brother at Bethel, thinking he's all alone. It turns out that there's angelic beings all around him coming from the earth up to heaven. God gives him a sight of that so he knows that he is not alone. These angelic creatures are sometimes delivering the chosen people. Jacob, again, you know, when he comes back down into the promised land, before he wrestles with a man at night, in that same chapter, early in the chapter, he meets two messengers, and they're not human, who assure him that all is well, that God is with him. We might assume there is much more angelic activity going on behind the scene than what is told. I want us to focus more, though, on human activity, because that's more our lot. One of the big themes of the book is human life. Parenting, pairing, you know. God is the one who brings together the man and the woman. It was not good for the man to be alone. And so he creates a, a counterpart for him. And throughout the, the book of Genesis, this notion of the family in this form goes on. God is the author of the husband and wife union. And their procreation, their creating of the seed, something which was promised from the beginning, that this theme of the seed is so big in the book of Genesis that, you know, all sorts of couples have offspring, have seed, if you will, but there was a line of sorts that God was nurturing through whom the victor would ultimately come. Sadly, when you talk about family life in Genesis, you also see a whole lot of dysfunction, you don't have to get too far into Genesis before you see people making a mess of the divine plan. I mean, it's not too far before you see, start seeing polygamy, including some of God's choice people, Abraham and Jacob, notably. Polygamy, sexual defilement, you see it in its worst form in Sodom and Gomorrah. And then the, the rifts among the brothers, the broken brotherhood. What a huge recurring problem this is in Genesis. The first two brothers... One of them ends up dead, Cain and Abel. How about Noah's boys, Shem, Ham, and Japheth? Ham, not so good. Ishmael and Isaac, a rift. Esau and Jacob, a rift. Joseph and his ten older brothers, what a rift. I think one reason that Moses is inspired to highlight those things is to remind the children of Israel how prone to fracture they will be. They are a brotherhood, and they must guard the, the family life that we have. We, as Christians, we are a brotherhood, and we need to be aware of fracturing within our spiritual family. Family life. Governance, of course, just as God... Uh, uh, the theme of dominion was true of him, so also of mankind. Mankind is called to subdue the earth. Uh, but after, uh, it, it's interesting that the control of the world becomes a divided thing, particularly when you get to chapter 10 and the Tower of Babel. Uh, there, there's this attempt for mankind to usurp uh, divine authority in some way. And so God intervenes and creates the diversity of languages, which results in the diversity of nations. And peoples, and so governance of the world becomes something that is divided, and that is by divine design until the end. Flip the page. Uh, maybe this one ought to be number one, but sin. Wow, boy, isn't this a huge theme? It's not just in the fall in chapter three, it's in practically every chapter. Sometimes it's commented on, often it isn't. But sin, like I mentioned before, is like this massive meteor strike that has created a drain, a pull on all of humanity, and there's no escaping from it on our own. And that, of course, leads, number four, to death. Death. 
the Lord promised Adam and Eve, warned them that in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. There was some kind, some dimension of death that they experienced at that moment, and it began a process of death, which we all eventually succumb to. It is fascinating in Genesis, particularly the early chapters, you read the genealogies, and he lived so and so many days, and he did such and such, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. It re it's almost like a drum that beats throughout the pages, the early pages of the book. But you never see it said about God. He's the one person in the whole book who outlives everybody. It's not all sin and death, though. There's also faith and obedience. There are people like Abel and people like Seth and people like Noah and Shem and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and even his brothers to a degree who to different degrees, sometimes in most dramatic ways, believe and obey and are examples of faith and trust to us today. Just as God covenanted with people, we also see mankind making covenants. There are recorded in Genesis a few covenants that are made. Uh, Jacob makes a covenant with Laban that they're not going to trespass on each other's property. They're not going to go to war with each other so long as they're faithful to each, their obligations. And they enter into covenant with God, key persons. Again, uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in particular. What a solemn thing it is. You and I, by the way, are in covenant with God. It's called the New Covenant, and we have some tokens of that. We, when someone, after someone becomes a believer, they're baptized. That is a, a sign of our covenant relationship with the Lord. Once a month in our church, we observe together the Lord's table, uh, a, a sign of the union we have in this New Covenant relationship, and God is going to one day bring all of Israel, all Israel shall be saved and be brought back into the covenant that was prophesied for them. I already mentioned the, the division of human governance uh, and nation formation is you, something you see. Chapter 11 is something that's called the table or the tablet of nations. It's a list of all the different people groups known to Israel and it's a way of explaining, well, where did this ite and those ites and these people and those, th where did they all come from? And Genesis chapter 11 explains. It sort of gives them a, a political map of their day and then carves out a spot in the world and this is the place I've given for you. And of course, the nation of Israel is being formed slowly but surely in the book of Genesis, the patriarchs, the founding fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lastly, let me, let's consider some physical settings that are key themes in the book. There is the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew word for earth is eretz. And interestingly, it's the same word that is sometimes translated as land. God made all the earth, it was good. The earth is, becomes cursed. But then God intervenes in history and he chooses one piece of Eretz and promises it to Abraham and his descendants. It's as if God is gonna start with a piece of the world and make it new to some degree. And of course we know how it goes. It is in that piece of the world that Messiah will be born and die and rise from the dead. It is that piece in the world where Messiah will come again and rule and reign from which Eden will begin to see its restoration. The earth and the land is a key theme. The garden which is in Eden is a key theme. Amazing place, beautiful place, lost because of our sin. But as the pages of the rest of the Bible will unfold, not lost forever, a place that will be restored. The different nations of the world we talked on, talked about or mentioned, including number four, the land of the Chaldees, a, a place where Abraham comes from, a, a place which much later in Israel's history they'll end up going back to unwillingly as captives. But just as God brought Abraham out of that place, so also centuries later he'd bring Israel out of that place. 
The promised land, of course, is the key land. It's the land that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob live in their whole lives. And, and not until the days of Jacob does anybody even build a thing. Abraham lives his, his hundred years in the promised land. He lives in tents. Isaac lives in tents. They, they intentionally do not go into the cities and live. Now, the, the exception to that is who? Lot. And what a city he picks, Sodom. And that didn't go well. <laughs> uh, God was teaching them, uh, you need to wait. Uh, dwell in this land as if it's yours, yet it's not yours yet. This is the land of promise. And later God would bring the people in the days of Moses and Joshua to the land to possess it. And then there's the land of Egypt, which at the end of Genesis is a place of protection. God sovereignly brought them to Egypt. It was good for them to be in Egypt. But they needed to be careful because it was also a place of danger. I mean, if you could teleport back in the ancient world and uh, walk around Canaan in Jacob's day, and then teleport over to Egypt. Wow, what a difference. Egypt is massively developed. Egypt is majestic. The, the pyramid, there were pyramids that had been standing for a thousand years already. A tempting place. Now, the Lord puts Israel in the land of Goshen, sort of set apart from a lot of of that stuff, but it was a tempting place. You know, Isaac was wise to obey the Lord not to go down to Egypt. The Lord authorized Jacob to do it. It would become a place of danger, and Moses would have to wrestle with the Israelites over this because, you know, throughout their sojourns, they would think, you know what? It wasn't so bad back in Egypt. Moses, why did you bring us out here? Didn't we have better food and a better life? Who needs this promise plan? Yeah, Israel came out of Egypt in Moses' day, but a lot of Egypt didn't come out of them. The patriarchs were right to keep their focus. And so remember the resolve that we saw in Jacob at the end of his life? Don't you bury me here. And so Jacob and Joseph become the only two Israelites in the Old Testament to be mummified only so that they can be buried back in the promised land, the land of promise, uh, to literally, in their burial, put down roots. This is the place that God has chosen. Well, the Lord give us that kind of resolve in, in our lives too. We are to be in the world, but not of it. This world is not our home. We're on our way to someplace else to another time. And that's all part of the plan. God's plan for Israel wasn't just to be for Israel to be blessed, but that Israel would become a blessing to the rest of the world. And it's Israel's Messiah that brings the hope of new life to Gentiles like you and me so that we might know him and enter into the garden again. Join me, please, in prayer. Father, we're thankful for the time we've had these couple years to be studying the book of uh, Genesis and have this opportunity to crisscross again through its pages and to consider these major ideas which your Spirit inspired. So, Lord, may we learn, as Israel was to learn, about where we came from and how we got this way and what your plan and purpose is. May we be people who are committed first and foremost to your plan and purpose that you have a plan to bring redemption and righteousness and deliverance and salvation and glory back to the world. And that through the gospel of your Lord Jesus that we are living in a time of fulfillment as we await the final stage when King Jesus comes again. All this we pray in the name of our Savior. Amen.